Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. It is our joy that you're here with us to worship the Lord and celebrate Him. We're gonna sing some songs because when we sing, it reorients our soul and reminds us what we really believe. So the first song is gonna be a beautiful adaptation of this verse that maybe you've heard before. But whether this is the first time or the millionth time you've heard this, let's listen with a fresh heart. It's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And I'm a recipient of that. What about you? So we celebrate as a grateful people today. We're gonna sing in a moment. But before we do, why don't you just look to someone next to you and say, hi, welcome to church.
We want to celebrate that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And we love families here at Calvary. And we want to continue in worship with a baby dedication. So Janice, tell us the families we have the privilege to dedicate today. Yes, good morning. We're so excited to pause in the middle of worship to um, celebrate another act of worship. And these parents are here today to dedicate their children to the Lord. And you may ask, what does that mean, baby dedication? Well, these parents know that it's more about them than it is the child. It's about them standing up here before you, our church family, and saying, you know what, I'm gonna do my best to honor the Lord through the gift that he has given me, this precious child, right? To raise these children up to be world changers for Jesus. And it starts in the home. So let's meet these beautiful families. Uh, hi, my name is Craig Henry. This is my beautiful wife, Ro Henry. And this is our precious daughter, Olivia, AKA Livy and Lily, according to our grandparents, the grandparents. Um, She's special to us because no matter like how tiresome a day we had or rough a day, rough a day we've had, as soon as we see her, it all goes out the window and we're refreshed, so. I need a little Olivia in my life. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Tell us about your family here. Hi, my name is Shakanta Haynes. This is Nyla Renee Haynes. Um, Nyla's special to us because she has a contagious, boisterous laugh. That's, it's, when she meets someone, she's always saying hi. She says hi to like everyone when we're in the grocery store and I'm like, I wanna stop her sometimes, but you never know what a difference a, a hi from a child can make, so I just let her do her thing. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Nyla's changing the world already. And um, this is such a special moment for us. Um, Shikanta is one of our volunteers in Calvary Kids. And as a single mom, we just celebrate her this morning. And we have Eric and, Eric and Melissa here who serve in family ministry with us. And it, this is just a beautiful story of community and of our church family. Shikanta met Melissa through serving in, in Calvary Kids. And Melissa has walked alongside Shikanta. And you know what? As a single mom, Shikanta has not let that hold her back. And when talking to Melissa, who's been mentoring her and discipling her, her, she said one of the most incredible things about Shikanta is that she doesn't let a toddler hold her back. She takes her with her to the Bible studies. She, she never uses being a single mom and having a toddler as an excuse. She's all in growing in her walk with the Lord to raise a world-changing daughter of the yes. King. And, and Eric and Melissa, they're, they're serving, and that's an act of worship. They're serving, and they're partnering together. Our mission is to partner with parents to raise disciples. That's our mission in family ministry, and it takes all of us, and we know that we're better together. And so if you serve with us, or if you know, you're know you invited to serve with us, we know that that also is an act of worship, and we're all in this together to raise these children for the kingdom of God. Yes, and so as we lay hands on these families and pray for them, we're going to ask you also to extend a hand because this is a family and a community of faith. And so let's pray this prayer of dedication together. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we pray over these precious families, over baby Olivia and Nyla. God, we ask that you would protect them, that you would give their parents wisdom, that we as a church would come around them, that you would help them to at a young age to discover you, Jesus. They would give you all of their hearts. They would grow to be young women who, who model the gospel in love and kindness and courage and grace. And they would use their lives to be world changers, to draw many people to your love. So we pray this prayer over them as a church, as a family, and all of the people here at Calvary said, amen. 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 Let's give it up one more time for these families. And let's continue in a posture of worship to our good, good God.
remember the gospel together today. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sin 
Thank you for meeting us today. It is a joy to be in your presence. And we stop long enough to know you are with us. Thank you for being with us, Jesus. By the power of your spirit, we are together. You've made us one. And we are, we are delighted, Lord, to be in your house. So would you open up our eyes and our ears today to see and to hear the truth of your word. And your spirit is the one who empowers that to happen. So Holy Spirit, please have your full way in this place. And let it all be for the greater glory of the Son of God, who is alive forevermore, who is our King, who we love. We worship you and we pray in your name, Jesus. And if you agree, can you shout amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. Calvary family, how you doing? You, you made it through the monsoon to get to church. Hey, we're so glad that you guys are here. Uh, welcome to all of our campuses and to our online community. We are in a new series in the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you have a Bible, we'd love for you to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and Acts chapter 18. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you can just raise your hand and wherever you are, we want to provide a Bible for you. If you're a guest in the house, uh, this is our gift to you as a church. Uh, if you read this book with an open heart and mind, it will change your life. So we are going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians for the next four months. I mean, it's going to be uh, just a week by week study, and so I want to encourage you, read through the entire letter that Paul wrote to this Corinthian church all in one sitting, and then and, and then join us by going deeper. If you, you scan the QR code that's on your seat or on the screen, you're gonna find a daily devotional that we've written just for you. So you'll hear a weekend message. Then you have a chance all the way through the week to, to, to learn and dig deeper. And there's group questions as well. So you can get together with your group and say, how, how does this 2,000-year-old letter speak to us today? And one of the other things that we're gonna invite you to do as you scan that code is you'll find out all that's happening here at Calvary over the next couple of weeks. So this uh, afternoon, uh, we are going to do an indoor-outdoor tailgate uh, for all the guys. So all the guys in the house, uh, this afternoon, we'd love for you to show up. There's gonna be food trucks and just a kind of guys, all generations, young men and older men and grandfathers all together uh, breaking bread, celebrating uh, God's goodness. And then all the women of the house are getting together on Friday night for the gathering. Uh, all the women in the house say, the gathering? Yeah. All right, so this is like a couple thousand women all gathered in this house from all of our campuses, uh, worshiping together, and we can't wait to see you there. And then finally on Saturday, there's a baptism. And so if you've not made that decision, uh, to make that public confession of Jesus is my Savior, we would invite you to do that uh, on Saturday at the beach and and as you continue to go through uh, this QR code, you'll find out about freedom groups that are starting, uh, a chance for you to go on a seven-week journey with our church at all of our campuses on this journey of what does it mean for me to be free and find my identity in Christ. Uh, we'd love for you to join you in, in that effort. And then, 
And then finally, we're going to do something really unique next Saturday night. So maybe you've come to church here for a while, but you have questions. Why does Calvary do this? Or how do we address these issues in the church? And we're going to do an open Q&A with questions we're going to ask you to send in, but also some open mic questions next Saturday night after service. So you want to, you want to put Doug on the hot seat? You don't have a chance to ask that question. We invite you to do that because, listen, the letter of 1 Corinthians was actually written by Paul because of a series of questions that people in the church asked him about how do we do this, and what do we believe about that, and how do we get clarity about that? And so we thought uh, we'll do a, a version of 1 Corinthians letter answering next Saturday night. So uh, everyone just take a deep breath now. You made it, and you're here, and God is present, and he loves you. And if today you need hope, you've come to the right place. And so no that God loves you and sees you and knows you and wants to speak to you. And so let's just take a moment and pray and ask him to speak to us in a way that only he can. Father, we thank you for this moment in time. You have been good to us. God, if so many sort of reflect on our lives, we, we probably shouldn't be here in this moment except for your grace, your sustaining grace in our lives. And we know we all have issues and challenges and brokenness and unanswered questions and unsolved problems. We acknowledge that, but we acknowledge that together in your house with your people and that today you would speak to us by your spirit in a way that only you can and that we would leave with this refreshed sense of connection with you, of identity with you. And we pray you would do all this in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, that's a good way to start. Let's just start off by thanking God for his goodness, right? So if you're new to church or new to Christianity or new to the Bible, you might be asking this, what seems like an obvious question. Why, why would we spend four months reading a 2,000-year-old letter from the Apostle Paul to a church in Corinth? What does that have to do with us? And that would be a very good question. But here's the thing you need to know about the Bible. The Bible says of itself that it is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to judge the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The Bible itself is like a mirror. It helps you to see yourself as you really are. It's like a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And so as we read a 2,000-year-old letter, we know that God will speak to us through his word and by his spirit, and, and that is our expectation because you're gonna find out as we read through this letter, it's surprisingly relevant to life in South Florida in 2020. Three. So let's go back and do a little history. I want to set this book up. Uh, the Apostle Paul is a, a person who was saved by, by grace through Jesus, and now he becomes uh, the, the chief apostle of the church, and he travels all through the Roman world telling people that Jesus has risen from the dead. He is the Savior of the world, and he goes to some key cities. He starts in Jerusalem, where the Jewish church uh, begins and finds its place, and then he goes to places like Ephesus, the, the, the religious capital of the Gentile world and all their pagan worship. But he also goes to Athens, the intellectual capital, where all the philosophers and all the thought leaders of the ancient world live. But then he also goes to Rome, the political capital, where all the power brokers that run the world actually live. You see, Paul is targeting these cities led by God's spirit. But what makes Corinth unique? Corinth is the economic capital of the ancient world. If you traveled by sea in the ancient world, you would go through Corinth. What made Corinth so important? It was an isthmus on the very bottom of Greece in this little four and a half mile coast that separated two different seas, the Ionian Sea and the Aegean Sea. Well, they provided two ports of travel. And no sailor in their right mind would want to travel all the way around Greece because it was dangerous. And so a port city, a ship would pull up and it would, all of its cargo would be offloaded and loaded to another ship over this four and a half mile trek, which means lots of sailors and lots of commerce came through Corinth. And Corinth was known for a place, well, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. Imagine thousands of sailors coming through a port city with lots of money to spend and what happens there? It's a lot of sensuality. It's a lot of sexuality. This is, this is like the Las Vegas or the Miami club scene that of the ancient world. I mean, if you go to Corinth today, and Corinth is an actual place. I was just there last April. One of the first things you will see is this huge monolithic rock 
called the Acre Corinth. It, it kind of presides over the entire city. And if you climbed up that Acre Corinth back in the day, on the top of that was a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of sex and beauty and love. And on that mount, a thousand temple prostitutes served there. So if you were a sailor, you could find a girl or a child or whoever was part of that temple prostitution. It was a very dark and broken place that Paul comes to. They partied hard in Corinth without any conscience at all. And when Paul brings the gospel into all this wealth and sensuality and all these counterfeits, it actually begins to save people. And this thriving little church starts to grow in Corinth. Now, again, if you're still skeptical, is Corinth really a real place? Well, as I was there, we saw what were frescoes on what most people believe is the first Christian church in Corinth in the marketplace. And in the background of that little first church in Corinth, you'll see the temple to the god Apollo, where they would offer meat to idols. We're going to find out why that's important later on in the letter, that this, this little Christian church began to thrive in the middle of all this craziness, all this paganism. And you'll also see, if you go to Corinth, this little stone. And on this stone, it says, Erastus, the director of public works, a 20,000-seat amphitheater. So you know there was a lot going on in this town. And Erastus' name is actually listed in the Bible in the book of Romans. And so these actual locations and these actual people are rooted in history. This, this is not a fairy tale. This is a history story of how God entered time and space through his son Jesus to save the world and how the church first spread through Corinth and the ancient world and now how it's come to us. And this is really good news today if you need hope. Because if you're looking at our world in South Florida, like the world has gone crazy. The sensuality, the sexuality, the, the, just the, the, the gall that people have to live, how they want unapologetically. Like there's so much brokenness in our world and I almost feel like retreating. Like I don't know if Jesus and the gospel are strong enough to help us with the city. Well, you're gonna see in Corinth, in the face of all this, the gospel's gonna thrive in this, this little church, the Corinthian church that Paul plants. And as we look at what that must have been like back in the day, we're gonna look at Acts chapter 18. How did Paul get to this church and how does he counter all the counterfeits that he sees with the real thing who is Jesus? He gets to Corinth after some time spent in Athens and, in, and he meets two tent makers, one named Aquila and one named Priscilla. They are they're refugees from Rome because Claudius the governor kicked out every Jew from Rome. And so they fled to this place of Corinth. Paul meets them, and he works Monday through Friday making tents so that he can preach the gospel on the Sabbath. And in verse 4 of Acts chapter 18, here's what we read. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Kind of a unique thing because, because Jews and Greeks are now both hearing the gospel message. Corinth is a very diverse city. 400,000 slaves are in Corinth. 250,000 free people are in Corinth, Jews and Greeks, and people of all religious persuasions. And he goes to the synagogue and he tells them, Jesus is the promised Messiah. And to the Greeks, he is the son of God come to save the world from their sins. And if you put your faith and trust in him, you can be saved into this new family. And it causes quite a controversy. You know, everywhere the gospel goes, it brings controversy. You ever feel that at work sometimes when you try to bring up a conversation or with your neighbor, it gets a little tense. And so Paul is saying, Jesus is the Messiah. All these things are counterfeits. They're false identities. They're, they're, they're a false hope. And, and, and now the Jews, they, they get united together against Paul, and they kick him out of the synagogue. And so what does Paul do? He goes right next door and starts his church. Imagine that parking lot <laughs> and the controversy there. Look with me at verse 7. And then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, the worshiper of God. And Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. And one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack you and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. And this is a remarkable scene. He goes into the synagogue, 
And the synagogue leader himself becomes a Christian. So not only does he take uh, the whole church next door, he takes the leader of the synagogue. So a new leader of the synagogue has to take his place. That man's name is Sosothenes, and that's gonna be an important name in just a minute. And so Paul has this little thriving church happening right next to the synagogue, and people are being saved. And Paul knows persecution's coming because he's been beaten before. And Jesus appears to him and says, Paul, don't be afraid. I'm with you. And there are many people in this city. And maybe God would whisper that to you today, that in your workplace, he's with you, that you don't have to be afraid, because there are many people he has in the city, many people that need to know his love, and we are the ambassadors of Christ in this city. God has given us that charge. And that's, again, how, how an ancient word and vision from Jesus to Paul can speak to us today, that he is with us, and he has many people in the city. And so out of that, Paul begins to become even more bold. And now all the Jews and a bunch of religious leaders in the city unite against Paul, and they bring him to the proconsul. They bring him to the court of law. And if you go to ancient Corinth, there's a seat called the Bema seat. It's a raised platform. My wife and I stood right in front of it. And here in, in Corinth, will be one of the most important trials of the early Christian faith. Because on top of that Bema seat stood a man named Gallio. And we read about this account in the the book of Acts right after this. You can read it on your own when you get home. And, And the Jews bring Paul up in front of this Bema seat and Gallio is there. And they say, this man, he's perverting our law. And he start, they start to talk in this trial. And, and Galilee says, stop. All these names, Jesus, I'm sorry, I don't know these Jewish names, and all these words you're using, resurrection, they have nothing to do with the Roman Empire. And he throws the case out as they're presenting the case. And it creates such a controversy that Sosthenes, the new temple synagogue ruler, gets beaten up right in front of the proconsul, and he says he shows no concern. I'll just watch this guy get a beat down. You see, God knew on that trial someone was going to get a beat down. It wasn't going to be Paul, right? Now, here's why this is important. Gallio, the proconsul of this entire region, is brother to Seneca, one of the most powerful leaders in the Roman government. So when Gallio says, this new sect of Judaism, whatever this Christianity thing is, it has no bearing in the Roman government. We're not gonna even acknowledge this is an issue. Well, this provided protection for the Christian church for years in Corinth. So when you read through the letter to Corinthians, they're not suffering persecution. Their problem is not they're being attacked for their faith. The problem is they look so much like the culture of Corinth because they believe some of the cultural lies of Corinth that it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between those people who are in the church and aren't in the church in Corinth. And this sets up the reason and the tone for the letter that Paul's gonna write. It sounds a lot different than some of the other letters that he writes because he's going to speak to them as a father. You see, the the letter of 1 Corinthians came because people in the church are writing him letters asking him, what about this and what about this and what do we do about this? Because after 18 months, he left. And over the next three years, things degenerated in Corinth. The worship services began to get out of control. Sensuality and sexuality began to enter the church. You had all these divisions and and tribes about who supports who, and communion became this chaotic moment. Worship people were speaking in tongues all over each other, and and everyone's going, well, what do we do about this? And so Paul's gonna speak as a pastor. He's gonna speak as a father, and he's gonna speak with authority into their lives to give them clarity on how do we embrace what the gospel means in our lives and in this city. And and he's gonna start not with trying to solve all their problems, but he's gonna start with their identity. And this is important. As we read the first 10 verses of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 10 times in 10 verses, we're gonna see the name Jesus Christ. Because if you know who you are, then you will know what to do. If you know who you are, you know whose you are, you will know what to do. And so we read in verse one, 1 Corinthians chapter one. Now Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. (gasps) Hmm, isn't that the guy that got the beat down? 
from the proconsul? Yeah, could it be that he became a Christian? Could it be that he's actually writing the letter of 1 Corinthians as Paul's dictating it? These are things that should make you curious, like, whoa. Could it be that one of the staunchest opponents of Christianity, much like Paul, actually became a Christian himself and now is a leader in the church? How many of you know that those people most antagonistic against the gospel sometimes become its greatest leaders? Come on, you remember you. I remember me. And I was like, man, I was rough. But you can't hide from God. If he's coming after you, he's gonna get you, right? To the church of God, in Corinth, those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be whole, his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, Paul's already starting with identity. He's saying, this is who I am. I am an apostle of Christ. And I, I, I'm brothers and sisters with you, and, and you are the church of Corinth, and you are in Corinth, but you're also in Christ. That's your identity. And, and you're together with all people who call on the name of Jesus all over the world, everywhere. You are part of the same family. This is your identity. Paul's gonna say it over and over and over. This, this is your identity. And what is identity? Identity is the distinguishing character of an individual. What is the most distinguishing thing about you. And as you think about that question, Paul's going to invite the Corinthians to think about what is the most important distinguishing thing about you that gives you your identity. He's an apostle of Jesus. We are brothers and sisters. We're together for this gospel work. And our primary identity and allegiance is found in Christ. Then verse four, he says, and I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him, you've been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech, and with all knowledge, and God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you don't lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed, and he will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, and God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord." I mean, you, you see this framework. Jesus, he chose you. Jesus, he's sanctifying you. He's making you holy. He's keeping you. And when he returns, he's coming back for you. He's, he's in you and among you and with you. Your identity is rooted in him and with everyone else who calls in the name of Christ. He keeps appealing back over and over and over. And he knows they got problems. How many of you know when you become a Christian, all your problems don't just go away like that? Yeah. And the person next to you is like, yeah, that's, that's definitely true with you, though. But Paul, Paul's saying this sanctification process that God is making you more like his son Jesus over time, that in a moment you're saved, but in a lifetime you become conformed and made like Jesus. And if you embrace that identity, that process, well, you, then you'll, you'll recognize this verse in the Bible, Philippians 1, 6, that, that he who began a good work in us is faithful to complete that work till the day of Christ Jesus. So all of us are in process. All of us are under construction. All of us are being formed into the image of Christ. And aren't you thankful that God is still at work in us, right? We all, we all still need his work and we all still need his grace. And so we can write down the simple big idea that Paul opens the letter to Corinthians with, and that's this, that real identity is found in Jesus. And that identity is secure. He's gonna keep us now, this identity, what does it mean to be a Christian? You know, in the early church, people called Christians lots of things before they called them Christians. They called them a sect of Judaism. They called them the way. They called them the followers of the Nazarene. But in the church of Antioch, when all these Greeks and Jews were worshiping together, they had to come up with a new name because they couldn't call them Jews because there were so many Greeks in the church. They couldn't call them slaves because there were so many free people in the church. They couldn't call them men because there were so many women. They couldn't call them rich because there were so many poor. It was this incredible mixture of people. So they had to come up with a new name to describe this new group of followers of this man named Jesus. And so they came up with this word in Antioch, the word Christianos in the Greek. Christianos is interesting because the word Christ is the Greek translation of a Hebrew word for Messiah. And the word anos is, is a Roman or Latin ending. So it's a Hebrew and Greek and Roman mashup word that sort of says, we don't actually know how to describe this group of people because they don't fit any type of category. So we have to create a new identity for a group of people that shouldn't all be in the same room together. 
And the only thing that actually puts them in the room together is that they are like little Christs, followers of Jesus. And you know, one of the coolest things about our church, one of the coolest things I love about our church is that when you look around, you're like, yeah, the two of you shouldn't be sitting next to each other. And the two of you, you don't look like you belong. Because, well, you come from different backgrounds and you speak different languages and you're of different ages and you have different ways to see the world and different political affiliations and different things, that, that the ways that you were brought up, but, but yet you're all sitting together and you're all sitting under one name, the name of Jesus. Because he is our banner and he is the head of the church. And, and this is where Paul is going to get passionate. Because he, he's gonna point through all, all of his writings that, that we identify with Christ. And once we identify with Christ, he becomes our allegiance. And every other allegiance becomes less and less and less relevant. Whether you're Greek or Jewish or male or female or rich or poor or slave or free is irrelevant to the fact that you've been named by Jesus and you belong to Jesus and you belong to each other. And, and the church, the early church, would, would do this as people entered into this Symbol of baptism. You know, this Saturday we're gonna have a baptism. And baptism is a person going under the water and then coming up out of the water as a way to identify with the death and resurrection of Jesus. So this Saturday, if you've not been baptized and, and Jesus is your savior, I wanna invite you to come and as you go down in the water and up out of the water, you're gonna say, I am now identified with Jesus. I take on the name Christianos. I'm a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And not only do I identify with him, I identify with everyone else who calls on his name as well. In the same way we're united with Christ, we're also united with every person who calls Christ Lord all around the world through all the centuries of the last 2,000 years. We are all one big family. And this is not a metaphor. This is a spiritual reality. For everyone who calls in the name of Jesus, we get adopted by God and we spend eternity with God for the rest of our lives. And family with God is forever. And so just for a moment, can we thank God for making us family forever, right? And so, Paul, as a father, starts out with, guys, it's so good to hear from you, and here's what Jesus has done for us, and here's what he's doing in us, and, and I'm so encouraged that you have all the spiritual gifts you need, and you're gonna be in a really rough spot, but, 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 but now he's gonna give the reason for the letter. You know how you always wanna start a conversation out on a high note? Now in verse 10, he's gonna say, now I wanna speak to you like a father. And he says this. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree with one another in what you say, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say they were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas, but beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now the room grows quiet. I mean, this church that got this letter was probably a church of only 100 people. Imagine, we have a letter from the Apostle Paul after three years, and now they sit down and read it. And as they're reading it, you hear that Chloe, one of the congregants, has written Paul a letter. Can you imagine all the eyes look at Chloe like, oh. Hey guys, I've heard there's divisions among you, and fighting, and arguing. And people that are saying, like, I follow Paul. I thought, well, like, what, what, what's up? Is Christ divided? Like, well, like, where, where, where'd you guys get to? And why is Paul so passionate about addressing division? Because remember the idea of identity, that distinguishing characteristic of a person? What did Jesus say would be the most distinguishing characteristic of those who followed him? They will know you are my disciples by the way you love each other. Not, not by who you follow, not by what church you go to, not by how famous you are. The world is watching for a group of people 
that shouldn't be in the same room, that are in the same room, that should be divided but are not divided because their primary distinguishing identity is I live and serve under the banner of Jesus. That makes all of us family, all of us one, right? This is, this is what Paul is pushing forward. And he, he's saying to the Corinthians, you have fallen for a counterfeit identity. And you can write it down this way. Counterfeit identity looks a lot like the real thing. In fact, the closer the counterfeit is to the real thing, the easier it is to sort of fall prey to it. And so I want to just show you for a moment. I've got, I've got $200 bills here. Yeah, you'll take it, I know. Which one will you take? Because one of these is real. And one of these isn't. And they're probably 99% the same, which makes it interesting. But you know how you discover a counterfeit is not by studying counterfeits. You could spend your whole life studying counterfeits. But actually, the way they'll teach U.S. Treasury Department officials to, to recognize real bills is to study the real thing. And so the first thing you need to know if you're going to see if a $100 bill is actually real is to touch it. Because the paper is made of a combination of, of cotton and paper. It has a very unique feel. And a counterfeit always feels a little bit waxy or thin. Not only do you touch it, but you also tilt it. Because when you tilt it, you'll see certain colors come alive and certain parts of the hologram move, which is very hard to counterfeit. Not only do you touch it and tilt it, but you look at it and then... You look through it and notice the hologram image is a reflection of the main image on the bill. And so two bills can look 99% the same. One could have a lot of value and one could have no value. And how many of you know that Satan is a master of counterfeits? <laughs> Satan cannot make something new. All he can do is take what God has made and pervert it. And we would be wise. There's nothing original about Satan we would be wise to recognize how he takes something, sometimes a very good thing, and tries to make it the main thing and makes it a counterfeit. And, and, and Paul is saying, you, Corinthians, you have to resist the urge to follow good people in a way that gets in the way of the gospel. And, and he says it this way in, in, in Hebrews chapter five, as, as we, how do we learn to identify counterfeits? He says, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Paul uses this language a lot in Corinthians. You're like babies, but you should be like adults. You're eating baby food, you should be eating adult food. And he says the one way you can learn to distinguish the counterfeit from the real thing is to so know the real thing, to so know God's word, that when a counterfeit idea or ideology or thought comes before you, you're like, that doesn't feel right. It doesn't look right. And as I look here, and as I look here, huh, something's not real about that. I mean, what happened if every time we did this, we did this? How much different would our identity be shaped and our actions go along with that identity? Paul says, you guys have gotten to the point where you're saying, I follow Paul. I follow Peter, I follow Paul. Apollos is the, is the best speaker of the group. Peter, he was with Jesus. Paul, he is the apostle. Some even were like one-uppers. Well, I follow Jesus. I'm of this. And it's interesting. When, when you go back to Corinth, archaeologists have found a stone on the top of that monolithic rock. And it, would, it said this on the stone. I am of Aphrodite. That there were actually so many gods in Corinth that the, the Corinthians identify with their favorite god. And the Corinthian church was taking that same cultural idea. Well, if the pagans are, I'm of Aphrodite or Apollo, then we can say, I'm of Paul or Cephas or Apollos. And Paul would write to the Romans, do not be conformed to the way of thinking of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, it's so easy for those ideologies to, to creep into the church, and we don't even recognize them because we haven't, in constant use, be able to compare the real thing from... The counterfeit. And the problem is not having a favorite. It's okay to have a favorite church. It's okay to have a favorite pastor. But when you start to become prideful about it and get all the people that are with you against all the other people that aren't with you, and then you start to judge them and look down on them and like, well, you don't have what we have, then that's gonna lead to a counterfeit identity that's gonna lead to division within the church. And Paul's like, don't, don't be like a baby. Be like a mature person who sees everything in its own context. And, and Paul will use this language 10 times in the book of Corinthians, in the letter. 
don't you know? In other words, shouldn't you know already? By this time, you've been following Jesus now for, for three years. Don't you know? And he's appealing to them to be perfectly united in mind. So he says in chapter three of this, so don't boast about following a particular human leader for everything belongs to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life and death or present and future, everything belongs to you and you belong to Christ. So same team, same family, same mission, same last name. Did you know that? That with, with, with every, listen, with every church here in South Florida that preaches the gospel, we are on the same team. Did you know that? We're part of the same family. We have the same last name. It's not Calvary Chapel, it's Jesus Christ. He is our banner. He's the one we follow, right? And, and that's part of the maturity of being a follower of Jesus. Listen, the, the church of Corinth and the church of Galatia were completely different churches with completely different problems. But they still identify with Jesus as their Savior. So let's talk for a moment about today. Because you're like, okay, uh, the whole Aphrodite thing and the way they identified back then in Paul and Cephas, what does that have to do with my real life today? Well, the power broker in our world today is the one that we let tell us who we are. The one who can speak identity over us is the one who has power in a culture. And we live in a culture now with thousands of counterfeits. You just scroll through social media and people are finding their identity, their primary identity, the distinguishing character of who they are by the color of their skin or by their gender or by their sexuality or by their political affiliation or by their denomination. And I just wanna say something with as much clarity as I can. The color of your skin is not the most important part of you. Your sexuality is not the most important part of you. Your gender is not the most important part of you. The most important part of you is Christ in you. He chose you, he loved you, he forgave you, he adopted you, and all those other identities. They are distinguishing characteristics of you, but they don't have to be primary. Our primary allegiance should be to Jesus, and every other allegiance should be challenged by that one allegiance. So if you have more in common with Women, because you're a woman and some men have done some things that are hard and you don't find allegiance to Christians, then you'll find yourself back and forth if you do the same thing with gender or sexuality or your socioeconomic status. I only hang out with people of my socioeconomic status because I feel more in common with them than those people over there. Then you've adopted a counterfeit identity. Your primary allegiance and identity and fellowship and belonging are with Christians, no matter how old or young they are, or rich or poor they are, no matter what gender they are, what color they are, what language they speak, that's our primary belonging place. And that's how we as, as the church and the church for 2,000 years have established our identity. But we have in this country and in our world an identity crisis. See, once you, once you determine your identity, it creates a pathway for the way that you think and the way that you act, the way that you spend money, the people you hang out with. And I want to I prove to you how, how powerful identity is in shaping the actions that come from that identity. So I want you to show you this picture. So, so next Sunday, one of these guys is going to be happy and one of these guys is going to be sad because they have taken on the identity of their team, the Kansas City Chiefs or the Philadelphia Eagles. And listen, these guys have been willing to paint their faces and sit in the cold and spend thousands of dollars on gear and merch and parties and, and plane tickets and, and their life has been consumed with will my team win or not? And grown men who never express emotion on Sunday will either jump up and down and hug and cry and laugh or they'll hug other men and sob in heartbreak as their team has lost. All because they identified with the city and the team and those team colors. Don't tell me identity doesn't shape your life. Identity is powerful in shaping your life. Once you pick your team, the dolphins, <laughs> it, shapes, <laughs> it shapes your life in so many ways. And that happens in families. It happens in churches. And Tozer would say it this way, whatever we think about God is who we end up becoming. And in a world of so many counterfeits, well, Think of the biggest counterfeit in Corinth was this idea of sensuality. 
that how you looked on the outside, how appealing you were, how wealthy you were, that that mattered the most. But if you make your physical beauty, what you look like on the outside, the most important identity, well, you're gonna find. You can't lose enough weight or work out long enough or have enough cosmetic surgeries to keep up with that voice in your mind that says, you're losing ground, you're losing beauty, your body is aging, and well, if you lose all of that, no one will love you anymore. And so many people in South Florida chase that lie, including a young woman named Kayla, who's learning to follow Jesus and understand that her whole life was ground around. If I can just be beautiful on the outside, then I'll be okay with myself. And I want you to watch Kayla's story and see how her relationship with Jesus actually changed her identity. Take a look. I spent years of my life trying to be enough. My desire to be enough left me even more broken. When I was 21, somebody sent me an invite for Miss Cusco, which is where I'm from. My mom was like, you really should go. I, I changed everything completely. No carbs, a little piece of chicken and a big salad. I wanted to work hard and sacrifice things just to have them seen that, look at me, I can be pretty, I can be skinny. Look, look, um, let me show you. I guess I was just trying to win acceptance and, you know, feel my worth. I went through very heavy trauma when I was a kid. I promised myself that nobody was ever going to hurt me again. So in my heart, I believed, okay, I can control this. So I'm going to do everything I can to prove them wrong. I thought that the more desirable I was, the better people would love me or accept me. So I became a very sensual person. It was superficial. It was a really bad season in my life. The turning point was really when I gave my life to Christ. I grew up my whole life listened to the gospel, but it never did a click in my heart. I got to see the depth of the damage that I had in my heart. I got to see that all that facade of pride that I had from everything, from not only the beauty pageant, but from my childhood and from so many things. He wanted me to give him my hurt, my pain, my suffering. Little by little, the Lord put people in my life, put a community in me through CYA, Calvary Chapel Young Adults, where I could find people who spoke life to me and I got to see what the Lord was trying to do with me. He wanted to renew me. Believing that I had to perform to be loved changed when I met my husband. He was not with me just for the way that I looked. He was with me because of who I was in Christ, and it was different. This is the, the beautiful part of Jesus, that when you find your identity in him and you get to believe in him and he starts transforming you, you know, and changing your life, he will also give you your purpose. You will find the purpose, why I was created for it. I believe that my purpose is show people and tell girls and young adults my story. Let me show you how the Lord really freed me from this same thing that you are going through right now but I know that there is more and I know that he can heal you and he can restore you and that there is true freedom in the Lord. God used the things that I went through to show me how real and deep his love is for me. Yes, it's a good thing when, when you believe a lie. You believe something that sounds really good and that works for a while. Then when you come to an end of yourself, you realize that all along, Jesus has chosen your identity for you. And that identity is secure in him. And that he loves you no matter what you look like on the outside. and Even regardless of your mistakes and your failings, that he, he sees you and loves you. And in, in Christ, he's going to present you to the Father without fault and with great joy, and that's good news for all of those of us who are call ourselves followers of Jesus. You know, in, in 1964, 
a term was coined that we know very well today. It's the term identity theft. Anybody here been a victim of identity theft? Someone uses your phone number and your social security number and your bank accounts and they pretend to be you. They take on your identity and now all of a sudden your life suffers because of an identity thief. But listen, I wanna say to you that identity theft didn't start in 1964. It started from the very beginning of time with Adam and Eve in the garden. Jesus would say, I'm the good shepherd, and if you listen to my voice and you hear my voice, I'll lead you to green pastures and to an abundant life. But there is one who's come to steal and to kill and to destroy. And he's the enemy of your soul, and he will whisper lies over you, lies about who you are. And if you believe those lies and you walk down that path, well, you won't be free anymore. And I think so many people outside the church have fallen for the identity theft of Satan, but also so many inside the church have fallen for that identity theft. And one of the reasons why we have gone all in uh, in February and March on this idea of these freedom groups is because we want people to get their identity back. We want people to find freedom. I think right now there's 1,700 people at all of our campuses that have signed up to do this seven-week study and I just want to say, like, if you haven't yet, I want to invite you, just scan that QR code and sign up. It's a way for you to go, you know what, I want to make sure I know who I am in Christ. And if you already know, then help us lead a group so that other people can know their identity in Christ because Satan's goal for people is to isolate them, to make you think you're the only one. But we know that Christ said, when the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. And it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. And we wanna live in the freedom of a real identity in Jesus. And so I wanna encourage you, step into that space as we begin these in mid-February. And let's watch God do a good work in us, in our groups, and in our entire church. And then finally, I wanna say that as we finish through the book of 1 Corinthians, over the next couple of months, I wanna ask you just, just to read through the entire letter in one sitting, if you can do that, and just begin to ask questions, God, how does this relate to me and what questions do I have? And, and even as we invite you early to ask questions uh, for this next Saturday night because there's something about a beautiful clarity to go, you know, I've had like a dozen questions since I've been coming to Calvary about all sorts of things. How does the church deal with these divisive issues and what does the church believe about this and what about my particular issue and challenge that I haven't been able to figure out yet? Well, then, then text that question in and come next Saturday night and let's have a cup of coffee and some cookies and hang out and talk together so that the enemy doesn't whisper to you things that actually aren't true about your life or this church or the world or what we believe or how we do what we do. And, and let's let no divisions be among us. Let's walk together, as Paul says to the church, in perfect unity by the grace of God. And so I wanna close with where we started. The only real identity you'll ever find is in Jesus. And the better the counterfeit, but the more deceptive it is, and the more we need to examine God's word to say, God, help me never to fall for our counterfeit identity again. And by the grace of God and by your word and with the church, we can do this together. So church, let's walk together through this book in grace, in unity, in love, and let's represent Jesus' name in our city. And let's give God a big amen. And let's pray. Father, thank you for this church and thank you for your word and thank you for how an ancient letter can still guide us today. And we pray now that as you have our undivided attention, if there's anyone in this room who doesn't know your love, that you would draw them now by your grace in this miraculous work of salvation. And we pray this in Christ's name. Hey, before I say amen, we wanna offer a simple opportunity this is part of the ethos at Calvary that after we teach a, a message, we always give people an invitation. If you're hungry, Jesus wants to give you spiritual food. If you're thirsty, he can quench your spiritual thirst. And I wanna share with you Jesus' most well-known story because it's a story about identity. <clears throat> Jesus talks about two brothers. One brother who lives with his father and dutifully does what his father says and a younger called the prodigal son who says to his father one day, I don't wanna live under your shadow anymore. So give me my inheritance, let me go live my life. Because in his mind, he believed this lie. I'm the man. I'm my own man. I don't need my dad or tradition or other people telling me what to do. He got his inheritance and he took off. And for a while, it was going really well. Because when you have cash, 
You can believe you are the man. He threw a party, people came. He asked girls out, they said yes. He could buy friends and influence, except when you believe this lie that you are the man, well, life happens. And you will discover that false identity, that counterfeit will lead you to this place. And when he ran out of money, he ran out of friends. And the temptation when you're down here is to believe another lie. I've fallen so far away. I'm no longer a son. I'm just a slave. You see, the enemy of your soul will often boost you up. You can handle this. You can be this. You don't need other people telling you what to do. And then when you fail, he'll go, I can't believe you did that. You're not worthy to come back. This is the one-two punch of the enemy when it comes to identity. And so he's now broke and starving to death and feeding pigs to survive. And he wants to even eat the food that he's feeding the pigs. That's how bad it was. And then Jesus says, this prodigal son had a moment. He came to himself. If I was just a slave, that mindset, if I could just be a slave to my dad, a servant, at least I'll have food to eat. And so he starts the long walk home. And that was a long walk. He had a lot of time to think about how he had believed a lie, how he had wasted his entire inheritance, how he thought he was so right. And how unworthy he felt. He was rehearsing the speech. And when his father saw him a long way away, his father ran him. And he started to rehearse and say the speech he'd been rehearsing. Father, forgive me for I have sinned. He starts this speech. And father's like, shh, shh, shh. Calls the servants. Get the royal robe. Get the shoes. Kill the calf. We're going to have a party because my son, my son, who was lost, is now found. The father never forgets your identity. No matter how far you run. He watches you say, I'm the man, I'm the woman, I'm the boss, I don't need anybody. He watches you fall and think, I'm a nobody, and there's no way back. And he offers you the true identity. You are a son or daughter, and if you come to me, grace will be given, your identity will be restored, and your future life will be so beautiful because when you know who you are, well, then you'll know what to do. Jesus told this story for a reason. Because he was the one who came to return us back to the Father. Our sin had separated us from God, and Jesus came to die to pay our sin debt, and he would say to his disciples, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one can get to the Father except through me. And so, if you wanna experience forgiveness of sin, if you wanna find yourself again, Find yourself in me, the one who made you, the one who died for you, the one who loves you, and the one that can hold you in his hand and keep you until he comes back for you. And this is the invitation. If you don't know that peace and know that purpose and have that identity, today you can by what we call a simple act of faith. God blesses faith and God blesses courage. We're gonna ask you, if you wanna know Jesus that way and ask him to forgive all of your sins, we're gonna ask you to stand up and walk to this platform and pray a simple prayer. The prayer goes like this, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. Come into my life. And in that moment, you'll be forgiven. You'll be adopted. You'll be given a new name. And that's just day one of the grace of God. But that will require for you 20 seconds of insane courage to stand up in front of all these people and walk this way. But God's calling some of you today to take that step of faith. And if that's you, I'm gonna ask you right now to stand and walk this way. And we will applaud that decision with all of heaven as you come, if that's you. Come now.
We as a church, we celebrate with you right now as you make this decision to give your lives to Jesus. And this is a decision you'll never regret. You guys can come this way if you want. Come on, for those of you who are still in your seats, you can still join us. We want you to be a part of this moment as we celebrate the good grace of God. So as you say this prayer and make this confession, the Bible says, all your sins are gonna be forgiven, washed away. Not just your sins, but the shame and the guilt and the blame of those sins that Jesus is gonna take on for you. But as you confess, that you believe that Jesus died for you and God raised him from the dead and you're ready to follow him, that you will be saved. The most powerful words that will ever come out of your mouth are about to come out of your mouth. And your names are about to be written in a book in heaven called the Book of Life. And you're about to be adopted as a son and we're a daughter of God. And that's a forever thing. And so as we get ready to pray this prayer, I just want to pause for one more moment. And I know in a room this size and for people who are watching at a campus or online, there's that like moment of tension, like I should go up and now I missed it and maybe I'll do this later. And when I was wrestling with whether I should give my life to God and follow Jesus, I did that a hundred times. I was like, the procrastinator of procrastinators. And I just want you to know that God loves procrastinators. He loves you. He's been waiting for you for a long time. And in a simple act of faith, because that wrestling indicates there's something going on inside. And this is God's love pulling you. I love you. I want to free you. I want to give you your identity and give you your purpose in a whole new way. I want you to go to heaven. And if that's you and you're wrestling right now, I'm just going to, we're not going to play another song. Just, just get up out of your seat wherever you are because God will bless your faith and your courage as you come. If that's you, come now. Welcome to the family. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Welcome. Welcome. And now for those of you who are ready to pray, I'm going to give you the words of this prayer. And I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. This is your prayer to God. He will hear this prayer. And he will answer it. Say this, say this out loud after me. Lord God, I open my heart. And I invite you inside. Forgive my sin. Today I repent. Now fill me with your spirit. And I will walk with you all the days of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys, welcome to the family of God. So you just made the most important decision of your life. So before you go back to your seats, I want to ask you, for five more minutes. Five minutes to follow me and our guys over to that room where we wanna give you a Bible and have a quick conversation with you. So if you guys can go that way, I'll meet you there. Church, let's stand together. We wanna to close in a song of praise to Jesus, our King, our One, the One we worship.